What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we're coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter. Maybe you're listening to us later on Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice, wherever you are listening or tuning in, except for one place, Pete is going to make fun of you about Pete. What was that? What was that? What was the quote? Well, I, I don't know. You know, how many people are, are live? You know what I mean? Probably people are listening to it later. You know, I mean, there's a lot I mean, of people. I don't want to just upset people listening later. Like, oh, I'm less No, than. but it's cool. Like, you make it like a cool, like, exclusive it's thing. Do you yeah, think these audience hell. questions that are coming in live are made up by my bur- several burner accounts? Yes. <laughs> no, yes, only half of them are. Oh, well, I mean, okay. that's because, uh, I mean, all the names are like Jorston, Giarston. Yeah, I'm not good Justine. at aliens. Like, we, got Rich, we got Rich on Facebook. He says, there I'm you here. Go. Yeah, He's hey, from the Book of Faces. <laughs> that's right. He's got to be real. Lo- I love it. I can catch the live stream. It's oh, okay. Okay. Everyone's coming in. It's like, it's a wonderful life, but much lower. Maybe it is live. <laughs> Pete, I hope you learned an important lesson tonight. Yeah, and I, I, I learned sure an important lesson, or am about to, from our amazing guests here. Uh, later in the show, we're going to be talking to Tilly Walden about her book, Clementine. But now, why don't we bring in our first guest? He is an artist known for so many things, but the upcoming project is the appropriately named The Marvel Art of Alex Believe. Ladies and gentlemen... Alex Believe, hello! Hey, hey. Yes. Welcome. Uh, so excited to have you here. This is a project that is going to be released at some point soon, we believe, on Kickstarter. There's actually, if I got this right, there's two volumes. There's the uh, Marvel Art of David Mack and the Marvel Art of Alex Believe. It's a joint project with Marvel and Clover Press, I believe, if that's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um this book looks amazing. I've yes. literally only, I, obviously yeah. we've seen so much of your art. We've really only seen the cover of this, but to take it back, like what was the impetus for this, putting together the art book and what was sort of your mission statement in putting it together? Um, first of all, hello, Pete and Justin. I've been eavesdropping for a little while. Oh! <laughs> I thought right. you guys can hear me. I was talking to you for, you know. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Sorry we couldn't hear you. All that Batman Lego stuff, I had comments about it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we all do. Uh, to, to get back to, to, the, to the question, um, which was what again? Anyway, uh, so <laughs> why, why are we doing this? Why? Because we haven't done it before. Just like mm-hmm. I've done, uh, I've never done a podcast. Uh, life. Oh, wow, there we go. firsts. A lot yeah. of firsts happening. All right, you, you talk among yourselves. I'm just going to listen. You know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it would be great. Uh-oh. Um, We're going to well, listen to you. So, no, no, I've not, I've, I've never done this before. I swear. Like, I'm, I, I'm nervous. I'm uh, self-conscious. I, I don't like when people hear me speaking with an accent. You know, it's, it's, it's this whole thing. Oh, First off, uh, Alex, you sound great. You're already roasting our Alex about his leg. <laughs> so you're crushing it. You're yeah, a pe- practically up, a co-host. <laughs> I heard your story 10 minutes ago, so I'm not going to bring that <laughs> <laughs> I could. <laughs> He's but got dirt mean, on us, man. I mean, he was there you know. before the mics turned on. <laughs> see, see I love it. Not, you're blushing. You're blushing. Yeah. I, know, I, it's, you know. I feel I, this is a roast of the comic book club. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, First time I'm, podcaster. I'm, already I'm, bringing pro- the heat. I'm projecting right now, so this is good. Like this yeah. is yeah, it's working. It's you're working. killing it. I love it. <laughs> All right, so uh, we cancel Justin. So I'm gonna take care of Pete now. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. <laughs> <Bring> <laughs> All right, so uh, enough bullshit. So why are we doing this? Because we haven't done it before. I, I, it's just been, uh, people have been asking me, uh, and this is true when people say people have been asking and talking about it. This time it's true. People have been asking me about um, an, an art book for a while. And I have I bet. so much. I mean, I haven't, like 25 years of career, I haven't done it. Uh, why? Because I never thought I had enough good stuff to put in a book. Wow. And I still don't think so. Uh, but I was kind of like uh, coerced into doing it, and, and like I sleepwalk through saying no, and I should have probably. <laughs> so now you're gonna have one, you know. That's uh, I committed to it, and um, it's done. It's, well, I mean, it's not done, but it's 
it's going to happen. I'm glad it's happening. However, it's yeah. uh, your your art is amazing. Well, I also thanks. wanted to talk to you about some of the art you have behind you there. <laughs> uh, some of the art that you uh, that you have behind you. Oh, you were doing the uh, the Daredevil pose. Well, I thought is, you were this, trying this to pick a fight actually, with me. I, I, I have a photo of this as I was posing for that. Oh, I mean, that you pose for your own pictures. That's cool. Not, well, if I could upload one now, people will see it. But it's it's. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't look like that. How long have you been working out? How <laughs> yeah, long I was have you been working say, out to match? You that? look like, shredded. Like twenty shredded, years ago, man. I was shredded. I was swimming. I was lifting. Yeah, <laughs> by aquans and everything. I swim through the channel. Okay, never mind. Uh, so, um, so this it's a good cover. It's one of my favorites. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I know Pete was asking about the stuff behind you, and we will get back to that, Pete. Pete is always very yeah. interested in what people have in their He's rooms. Bad. But it's interesting to hear you say you were tentative about putting this book together, because obviously, as fans of your work, as fans of the comics that you've done over many, many years, we love looking at your stuff. How, how do you pick and choose, then, once you've been coerced into doing this art book, how, how do you come up with the flow of the book? What is important to you in terms of here, here, what goes in there? I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, and I hate saying this, but this is an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> How did that creep up into interviews the last few years? It's, it's always like, oh, this is a great question. Always, uh, always. We were just to. talking about that as it's something that people now it's a gives them time to think. Yeah, so I know. Well, compliment, but I have the answer to this. I don't need to think about it, but it's a BS. But this is like Alex on Alex love. Alex is going to be boosting <laughs> no, I, up I'll, Alex's. Okay, so if you just if you ask me a question, I'm not going to say it's an excellent question. I'm going to say it's a I know you won't say it to me because I'm just <laughs> a right. lowly Justin over here. I'm canceled by you five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so why why are we doing this? Um, uh, I was convinced to do it because now I think I amassed a volume of work, which um, it's the last, well, Again, it's uh, uh, the, the last two and a half years. I um, since the pandemic started, I we spent a lot of time at home, as you guys probably oh, yeah. as well. And and one of the things that kept me sane was painting. And I just drew something every day. I did watercolors. Uh, I painted. I I, I worked wow. real, like literally every day. And and I at some point I looked at the files and I have like. 150, 200 uh, watercolors that mm -hmm. I just did over the last two and a half years. Um, so all of a sudden, I have a pool of artwork I can choose from. And there are maybe 10 pieces that I want to show, but they're asking for 175, which is tough. Uh, <laughs> that is many more. Uh, I'm sure yeah. you're just being uh, shy about it. No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. There, well, not 10, let's say 100, but. Uh, so th now I have something to choose from. Now, now I can, I, you know, show my cards and say, okay, this is what I did in the last few years. Um, because what is different now is, is um, it's not just comic books. It's it's not just a, a page a page mm -hmm. count. Uh, it's not just a cover. It's it's just so much more that oh, wow. you know people went into the studio and they recorded albums. They they they. they uh, started baking, you know, all of a sudden we have cookbooks, uh, you know, everybody has a dog, you know, it's just, <laughs> I have watercolors that, it, and, 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 and now I can have a book, can put a book together. That's so cool. were you doing mostly uh, superheroes when you would get up and paint? And if so, like, how did you decide which where you were going to go on any given day? I, I did mostly superheroes because I just wanted to have another take on what I've done before. And, mm -hmm. and, right. and, you experiment with a lot of new media and then uh, this is new papers new paints new environments all kinds of stuff like that so to to, to do this over and over again is, is like you're cooking a dish but you're just putting an extra spice in it mm -hmm. so for me that was the challenge it's not just because i wanted to show uh dr doom in a different setting all the time i just wanted to try a different medium you know i wanted to see if, if i can do it in oils acrylics watercolors pencils something like that so for me that was just i'm i'm playing this is my playground and um it, it's a size of a, of a watercolor paper basically that's it <laughs> what um well, and what oh, what ahead, uh, what hero or character did you uh paint for the first time in pandemic 
and just sort of like, now's my time. Now, that's an excellent question, Justin. <laughs> I knew I'd get a good one in there. You're on cancel. It was. I, I remember this one. It, it, I, I'm not going to lie. It was Dr. Doom. It was a Dr. Doom <laughs> painting. Um, it was um, a three-quarter shot of him in a, uh, holding a sword um, in a like a dark bluish hue setting. Yeah, I... I remember exactly that piece. That was the first thing I did. Oh wow! It was an archer. Just paper. send us send us the photo of you in the same pose, and we'll we'll get a mind for them. <laughs> Sounds good to me. You can. What? I'll send it in the mail. How's that? Oh, that would be even better. You'll, you'll come with that check you've been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for checks from literally everybody. And then that, those tax returns, you know. <laughs> what is it like for you when you're creating art that is divorced? from the comic book form. Like specifically, I think when you're creating a page, like you were saying, you got the page count, you got the page turn, you got to worry about, you got the lettering, you got to make space for, you're obviously working with the writer, or if you're doing cover art, you have to make room for the title treatment and potentially the names of the creators. So when you're taking all that away, do you find that freeing? Because you're just- Liberating. Yeah. Liberating. <laughs> nice. It's it's incredible. This is what we actually want to do. I mean, not that we don't want to do the other thing. <laughs> um, and 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 no, people will say, no, no, he's talking shit. They know, they know, they know. Cool. Yeah. yeah, this is like it's a jam session. You know, I, I don't have to play, uh, you know, a classical piece in front of two hundred fifty people at the Carnegie Hall. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But here is it's just a this this is what makes this whole thing a lot of fun. And I'm fortunate, I have to say, I'm fortunate that we, we made it through that bad period um, yeah. with, with me working on art. A lot of people suffer for this. I, I did find a, 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 a venue where I felt comfortable. And it was, it, it kept, kept not just me, but the whole family sane. So oh, that's nice. cheers, cheers to that. I mean, I, yeah. I was lucky. I got to say I was lucky. Yeah, Before Pete snaps something, can in I his, drink? Can um, I drink on the yeah, please. Drink? We, we are. What are you having yeah, up there, Pete? Uh, it's just a beer, you know, just a oh, delicious, okay. tasty beer. <laughs> wow, uh, there it is. Uh, before I'll Pete uh, crushes, yeah, crushes ahead. that beer can in his hand, he he uh, was is very curious about what you have on the wall behind you. Uh, can you tell us what is in your studio or uh, place right now? Yeah. This is a piece by Dave McKean. Uh, ah, this ooh. this is a lithograph uh, by a Bulgarian artist. This oh, yeah, bring it closer. Thank you. Oh yeah. This I'm not supposed <laughs> to show you, but this is Whoa! my daughter, and this is a cover that is not being released yet, so no one has to see that. Okay, yeah, but that's I, our secret. Alex, you saw you saw uh, my my daughter just like 20 minutes ago, right? Yeah. So I use her as a model for this. Oh, oh wow. that's, great. that's awesome. And back there, I have a uh, poster by um, Christo, is the guy who um, wrapped up the Reichstag and did the yes, gates. Yes, I remember Park. he did the gates in Central Park. Yeah, exactly. So it's the gates. Um, I'm a very close friend with his nephew, so I got that poster from him. And, and back there, I have a um, French poster from the 30s, I think, or the 40s, uh, which I picked up at a uh, print place years ago. So... So, well, thank like, you for like sharing. Working. Yeah. So uh, we actually got a question here from YouTube from Derek Mainhart asked, your artwork has so many facets. Is there any of your process digital or is it all hand-drawn? Well, the the the, um, uh, the pages in a comic book, I work on digitally because it's just much, much, much faster. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a deadline and, and that deadline, deadline is um, looming over me like, the Motley sword. <laughs> <laughs> so he had like about, come sword. On, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, I'm not saying anything new. Uh, so this, um, uh, the comic book pages are done digitally. And, and this has been like this since the Daredevil days. I mean, not even, well, did it start with Sam and Twitch? Ooh. Maybe. Mm. So it's been a while. It's been, it's, it's been, yeah, it's been over 20 years. But the covers I do uh, by hand because they have a resale value, of course. Um, yeah, I was going to say. So that, that helps pay, you know, for the toys <laughs> that I have. Yeah. <laughs> the Batman the Lego. For my yeah. kid. For my kid. 
There uh, it is. And then, um, <laughs> just to be clear, Alex, that Batman Lego is not for Alex's kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's for me. That is. For me. I wasn't going to say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. my place. That's a it's a. It's very. Oh. It's an adult uh, building set. It's an yeah. adult Lego. <laughs> Uh, yes. Not that it, gets me interested now. <laughs> it's not like sexy. Just to be uh, clear. is it really? There are bad? nipples. Okay, there are nipples. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> the little the little dots at the at the end of the Lego. Those are uh -huh. all nipples, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, this okay. is getting yeah. weird. <laughs> all so right, if, let, let's go back to the question. So yes, yeah. Um, the pages are digital. Uh, the covers are um, by hand. Okay. Cool. Not all of them, but most of them. Yes. Yeah, nice. and, and yeah, some nice. pages, of course, some pages I do by uh, by hand as well. You know, some some of the things that um you know splash pages sometimes some some things I'd like to uh, uh, draw by hand I do I do that if I have time. Um, I did want to ask you uh, when we were talking earlier. You mentioned this. You are working on a new project with Brian Michael Bendis, which I'm very Ooh, excited wow. about. Uh, we don't have a yeah. specific date for that, but what can you tease about that, if anything? He was teasing it when he did the show. Yeah. A couple well, what did he say? He was teasing. Yeah, teasing. I, I think he honestly just said, and I'm doing another he project with Alex Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he just that, name that dropped is, you. That yeah. is true. Oh, that, I'm, I'll name drop him then. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is true. I think uh, we should be um, coming out issue one in September. It's an adventure book. Um, how much can I tease? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what he told you. Uh, it's an adventure book. It's it's fun. It's light. It's, um, it's not... Uh, people should not expect like a superhero stuff. It's um. Uh, think of it as um. Mm, like a heist book. Let's just say that. Oh, um, cool! Yeah. Oh, very cool. Uh, like it, that. It, Love the sound of that. So that, that's as far as I can go. I guess I'm, uh, without confirming with Brian. Well, okay. uh, in a very general sense, you guys have worked together so much, and we were talking to Brian a little bit about this with him and Michael Avon Oming in terms of their relationship developing, particularly now that Brian is doing all of the stuff at Dark Horse um, in a very different mode, and it feels very creatively exciting. What's different for you two now that you're working together on this project after so many years? Well, th again, this is not a dark book. Uh, yeah. Everything mm, yeah. we've done so far is pretty dark. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly yeah. the opposite. Yeah. Uh, it, it, but he, it's it's got Brian written all over it. Uh, you know everything, you, everything you love about him, it's going to be in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, how does that change the the tone of the book? How does that change your approach? Are you literally is it less dark well, uh, visually, he, 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 or is yes, it... it is. Yes, I I try to keep it. Um, um, I mean, it's not going to be like Daredevil. You know, it's it's it, yeah. it, it doesn't have that. It's not that much in the shadows unless it needs to be. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, we, we try to keep the, even the colors a little bit brighter and a little more vivid, uh, but I, I try to keep a lighter line through the whole thing. Oh, it, it's cool. like I'm, I'm looking uh, because for, for, for every book, Brian wants me to use a different style. Like he knows I'm sure. a chameleon and I can adjust to what he wants me to do. So he will bring up some ideas. I'll, I'll throw some stuff back at him and then we'll figure something out. Uh, to me, the ultimate thing, and it's always been like this, and it's really hard to achieve, is to become Alex Toth. You know, this is that that Alex that I'm another Alex, and just go. not another the Alex. <laughs> That's the one. Uh, All right. Apart the one uh, from the one that conquered the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that that one I'm not as far to to become, but Alex Toth is 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 what I'm looking at. I'm trying to keep a straight, clean line. I, I try to simplify things, which is super hard, and it's for me, it's almost impossible. But at least that's my goal. So with this book, um, I, I just try to be on a on a simple side. That that's what I'm trying to do. So people will, will, will look at it and go, well, but the, the the backgrounds are not that as detailed as you used to do the the backgrounds on Daredevil, you know. And it, it's not, it, it, but this is not that type of project. It, it needs to be um, somewhat. Um, simple i think cool. something we talked about with them is that like actually as you go on in this career the restrictions are actually helpful or sort of like uh just guidelines for the book uh something where it's like oh it has to be this way and actually frees you up to push into new areas mm -hmm. is that something that you also look look forward to with bendis or beyond well he with bendis is always he always tries to to to, to uh, push me into a new direction he even writes it in a script 
I want you to use something completely new. No one's ever done this before in a go brand. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not going to invent something out of my ass. But you're, you're just, do it like you did this. I'm like, okay, fine. I mean, I will try because he thinks that I can do everything. And and it's, it just happens that way. I mean, it, it, and then you can. He, he, and, he pushes and, and, you. and then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like <laughs> working like a dog trying to do what he wants me to do. So no, it's 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 a balance. We try to keep it. Um, we try to keep it fun. You know, it, it, cool. that's the most important thing is just to keep it fun. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, awesome. uh, well, cool. Thank you for keeping it fun, Alex. I'm really looking forward to the. Oh, art dude, book. this is over. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank I, you so much. I think he's so. like, yeah, you <laughs> did you it. Got a, you got a family. You never asked me a question, though. Come on, man. You were yeah. talking before, <laughs> before the whole thing so much. Peter, uh, well, I, I, I got Peach, wanted to talk about the background. I, yeah, Pete's I, I was, job is not to ask questions. Pete's job is to go, yeah, and ask well, about what's too. behind ooh, people. So I'm more of a drinker yeah. than a talker. Alex <laughs> is trying to cancel you, Pete. He wants you to yeah. some rope. Uh, seriously, though, Alex, yeah. Pete, thank you so much. Uh, very excited about the art book, even if your trepidation about it. It, it looks Can't awesome. And thank you. So this, this was a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey. That's the best compliment we get. Yeah, I, man, I shouldn't have dropped that ecstasy. I wasted it. <laughs> <laughs> Just when it was you kicking the whole night in. Ahead. All, yeah, yeah you enjoy your night. Ahead. All right. Yeah. Have no, a good guys, night. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. take care. Super fun. All right, there oh, we go. Man. Once again, Alex Believe. You can check out the Marvel art of Alex Believe and the Marvel art of David Mack. Those should be going up on Kickstarter pretty soon. No confirmed date, but keep tuned to Kickstarter. You can click a little button and it'll let you know as soon as the Kickstarter goes live. Click uh, and button. also, yeah, uh, September, button. as he plunked this new book with Brian Michael Bendis. Yeah, which can't wait for exciting. that. That sounds That's very gonna exciting. Be fun. Yeah. Why don't we bring in our next guest? She is the creator of one of our best graphic novels of the previous year, and maybe, I guess we'll see, one of our best graphic novels of this year as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Tilly Walden. Hello, hey, Tilly. Hey, welcome. welcome. Hey, hey. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, so, <laughs> a, as I mentioned before, you are the writer, artist, letterer is the other hat you wear, right, for Clementine? I'm never, 10 graphic novels in, I've never used a font, and I never will. Wow. I wow. love hand lettering. It makes my editors crazy, because <laughs> that is you need crazy. to add a comma, I have to go in and draw the comma. Oh, <laughs> wow. Man. Wow. wow. Sorry, Nine first art. question, first question off the dome, why do you do that? <laughs> why? I'll be honest, it looks better. It yeah. Just, I mean, it, great it, answer. There you the go. inks are in your hand and the letters are in your hand too. There's a cohesion that I'm just like, I'll never give it up. Although they, of course. they make incredible handwriting fonts these mm -hmm. days. Like people, mm -hmm. people do an amazing job and sometimes I can't tell and that's impressive. But I was going to say though, mostly you can't tell. Uh, yeah, you can tell. Can tell. <laughs> also, I feel like cartoonists forget that half of our job is logistics. It's like fitting shit into panels. Oh yeah. And when I hand letter, it means I can make the weirdest shaped speech bubbles I want, cram in every last like character and zombie and all the space. It makes my job easier because fonts fonts aren't flexible. Well, and also yeah, like uh, speaking. Uh, by the way, we're going to stay as spoiler free as possible about the second book because it's not coming out until October at this point. So okay, many months thank you for the road. Everyone yes, dies. That, was, that was specifically for Pete. Yeah, yeah that was know. like, don't spoil <laughs> the book. Yeah, uh, it's going to happen anyway. There's going to be a point by the end of the interview where Pete could be like, no spoilers, but I love these specific things for the end of the book. Uh, but anyway, regardless, uh, uh, the reason I brought this up is like, I think. The way you have these characters in these books, though, the words are almost pushing out of them. The emotion is coming out of them. So I think it makes sense that you do everything individually because the speech, the words are so personal to them at the same time. Totally. I think that the more in like a process that happens all at once, the better. So when I'm inking, I'm writing the dialogue. I'm designing the dialogue. I'm kind of designing the characters too. I don't, I don't really plan out how anything is going to look. Um, and it just like, it, it makes me have to really pay attention. And I love the idea that like people are like pushing stuff out of their mouths. I, I, have, I have so many comics pet peeves, but one of them is when people draw characters with their mouth closed, but then there's a speech bubble coming out. <laughs> like, that's not logical, open their mouth. But my other pet peeve <laughs> is when people smile too much in graphic novels. I'm like, no one smiles, well, go to New York. No one is smiling. Uh, now to take a big, 
take a big step back before we get too far, though, uh, for folks yeah. who don't know this, but I, I assume most <laughs> folks do. Uh, Clementine is a character in the world of Walking Dead that was first yes. introduced in the Telltale Games. Uh, Telltale Games is back now, I think, right, by the way, or something? <laughs> I don't know. That's not your job. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Regardless, don't, put that, don't put that on her. I would argue up until this point, the Telltale Games, Walking Dead, and particularly the story of Clementine, and I'm a fan of the whole thing, is maybe the best Walking Dead thing. Like that first game is phenomenal and it gets you. And yeah. It's amazing. Like, and you can play it again and again. And it, yeah. and it hits you. So it sounds like you've played the games. Yeah. And so there were a couple of games there that follow this character, Clementine, and then your book, Clementine Book 1 and Clementine Book 2 and the upcoming Clementine Book 3 follow the character further past those games. Um, and I, So that's the layout of the plot, in case anybody doesn't know. Before we get too far, though, there is one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, so every week on the show, we have an actual professional chef based in New Orleans who either curates a cocktail or creates a cocktail for us. And uh, this week, he actually created one. Uh, for Clementine, oh, that's the cover of your book. That's not that's the, cocktail. the cocktail. Oh, oh wow. weird! That cocktail yeah, doesn't look go. delicious. There we go. Yeah, so it's called the Clementine, Clementine. Uh, and it's gin, tequila, orange liqueur, egg white, Clementines, orange bitter, nutmeg, and a pinwheel Clementine. Uh, so there you go. That's a cocktail for Clementine. God damn it's it! That good. sounds so good. If I wasn't six months pregnant, I would be drinking five <laughs> of those right now. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll send you the recipe. Congratulations! We'll it Thank you for the book. Yes, first drink right after. I know, yeah, right? Exactly. I, like the baby comes out, and I'm like, "Someone get me a Clementine." <laughs> <laughs> Hospital should have bartenders for this. Experience. Oh, exactly. Oh my God, exactly. Exactly. dollar idea right there. That's yeah. the healthcare system I want to see in the world. <laughs> yes. So before we get into book two, even to get back to the book itself. Um, since you do have this basis of not just the greater world of The Walking Dead created by Robert Kirkman and explored the shows and everywhere else, but you've also got these telltale video games leading into this. Um, what, what was your mission statement coming into here? What did you try to do in terms of expanding this world and pushing it forward? It's really interesting. I think I there there could have been like a parallel universe where I did these books and I really kind of gave in to the pressure of the Walking Dead canon of End of the Universe and kind of pushed myself to make something that felt sort of safe for that mm -hmm. for that world. But I have to say that I think my mission statement was defined by my relationship with Robert and Skybound, which was one of them all just saying to me all the time, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, wow. Like the amount of freedom I had in this project was incredible because they were like, we wouldn't have asked you, you to do three books with Clementine if we didn't trust you. So wow. once I like really felt their trust, it became a matter of like, I obviously I've played the games multiple times. I've seen the show. I've read the comics, like everything Walking Dead, I've done it. Um, and I think that for me, the the concept for the trilogy is just that like all of that is the tapestry of the background, but the story itself has to be something new for me, new for Clementine, and new for The Walking Dead because it's it's been around for a long time. We've seen, I mean, every time I write these books, because I've written and drawn two, I'm writing book three right now, I come up with a name for a character and I'm like, this character already exists in the Walking Dead universe. Like there's <laughs> so big, every kind of villain it's been done. Like you really can't reinvent the wheel, but you can reinvent like how that wheel turns, if mm. that makes sense. Okay. And mm. I, I love the games, but the games were super traumatic for Clementine. And it's a video game, of course. Like this girl's gonna have to like jump through fire, literally lose a leg, literally. You know, she went through so much and then like my job, because they hired like the sensitive lesbian to work on these books, <laughs> was to like unpack all of this shit that happened to her in the games and create like a nuanced young adult. And that's really, it's honestly, it's really fun. Um, graphic novels are different from video games. So the trilogy had to be different from the games. And I think that's been hard for a lot of people because it's such a big shift. Um, but what I love about graphic novels is the amount of time you're allowed to spend on like the most minute details. So I've had so much fun, not only with the larger narratives in these books, but also with 
just the like little ins and outs of Clementine's life as an amputee, as this young queer woman, as as all of these things. I mean, she still can't really read. Every book I'm trying to push her reading ability just like a little bit more. <laughs> That's nice. uh, but I mean, if you're seven when the zombies show up, what are you gonna remember from school? The time. Oh, 100%. You don't have time for yeah. books. I'm trying uh, to teach a seven year old to read now and it's hard without zombies. So, See? Like, I, it's very Maybe the difficult. pressure of zombies would help, actually. Maybe we should. Like, oh, finish this chapter. <laughs> we gotta go. <laughs> He's coming. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say is I, I really appreciate the sunshine you're trying to inject into this insane world. Um, I, I also really appreciate the kind of like the, the feeling that jumps off the pages. It's really impressive. The amount of emotion and stuff that we're getting from still images from your work. Uh, how hard was it to, when you have these parameters of like the post-apocalyptic zombie world and like, you know, and uh, to kind of have these like loving, beautiful stories uh was it oh was it not as bad as maybe as it sounds was it nice to be able to kind of work within this insane parameter to find the beauty there or how was it for you to kind of go down this path it's interesting i think it's a it's like this big misconception amongst artists and creatives i hate that term creatives um <laughs> that that like freedom and like endlessness gives us like, oh my God, I love it. Like I can do whatever I want. Like my mind is a playground, all that bullshit. But actually <laughs> the parameters of this brutal world made my job so much easier because oh, I wow. think that finding emotion and beauty amidst like tragedy and hardship is like the most classic storytelling you can do. It's so, I don't know, it, it's so interesting and fun to try to carve out like joy and intimacy for these teenagers against like the walking dead backdrop. So I, I, I mean, maybe it'd be different for another artist, but I found it really engaging and really fun, but I also find constraints much easier to work within. Mm -hmm. Like give me a universe, give me like a page count and give me like two words I have to include in the book. And I'm like, I'll go because then oh, it's, nice. it's yeah. like, it's, it's almost like homework or it's like an assignment. Mm -hmm. It's not this like precious little book to you anymore. So I, I loved it. I found it so if creatively it's been great. I think the biggest challenge has been, I've never done a series before. Mm -hmm. And so I did not, I did not have a plan and no one, <laughs> no, one asked me, no one asked me what the plan was. They were just like, can you do book one? And I was like, you got it. Uh -huh. And then they were like, what's book two? And I was like, I'm not, you tell me, I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> Give me some parameters. Oh my God. Well, it, well, it's interesting to hear you say that because something that I think you did really effectively in the first book is build out this whole new cast for Clementine to interact with spoilers for anybody who has read it, they don't all make it out alive. So, Oh, like, come on. Sorry. Uh, but we're definitely, at the same time, following a bunch of them into the second book as well. So what was important for you in terms of, obviously it's a malleable group, but building out this group around Clementine, do they all come out of her character-wise or where does it start? I think that all the other characters come out of a contrast to Clementine. So everything that Clementine isn't, I try to put in the characters around her. So like, clearly she's not Amish. So I have an Amish character. She's not a twin and she's not evil. So I have those too. Um, and she's not, she's not always the most confident. So like I put a lot more confidence in these other characters um, and she is disabled, but it's been interesting writing other characters who are disabled in different ways from her, both as a contrast and as a way for them to connect. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess it, it all starts with Clementine, but writing the other characters is so fun because it's also a chance for me to put myself in the book. I get to like, I don't know, I get to, I'm not gonna say some things because it's just gonna be so many, so many spoilers are just gonna tumble out of my mouth, but I'll just leave it at that. I get to put myself in the book, how nice. <laughs> well, what now, and now oh, that right. you're working, you're working on book three, you said you're yeah. writing book three right now. So how, you said you never had a plan going into book two, did that change when you were like, oh, I should have a plan, or at least people are gonna ask me if I have a plan when you're going into the next one where it's time to have a plan. I still, to be honest, didn't really make a plan. I finished, I, as I was working on book two, I decided what the location was for book three and I decided who was gonna die. And that was it. Wow. And, wow. and that was, that's kind of all I need. If I know like, 
I, well, I'm not gonna say. Uh, careful, Tilly. Careful. Yeah, uh, not, uh, not, uh, uh, we're not trying to get you. Yeah, no, yeah. I know you're not trying to get me. I'm getting myself because I, <laughs> yeah. I was working on the outline for book three like 20 minutes ago. So it's like <laughs> so it's right in your head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just just the most basic facts. So for each book of this trilogy, I'm starting I'm starting from scratch. And honestly, it's through the hard work of my editor that the through lines really like appear mm. in the story because I think that it's so overwhelming to make a graphic novel. It takes forever. It's exhausting. You can only really have intense focus for so much of the time that you're working on a book. So luckily, Alex, my editor, Alex, um, oh has, I know. I'm sorry, what is going I'm on today? Theme of the night, Too man. many. It's going. I, I'll give him a new name, Harry. Harry. <laughs> there there we go. Um, That's it. Has helped to make sure that like everything is consistent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, obviously, it'd be easier to make a trilogy of books and plan all three books first. But why do things in an easy way? That's <laughs> well, but, well, but I think, honestly, I, I feel like it gives you. Yeah, I mean, I, we're about to say the same thing. Maybe I feel yes, like she that's was saying the, one, two, three. Nah, maybe not at the exact <laughs> <I question. laughs> oh, oh, wow, what? Wow. Uh, I feel like then you find it more interesting detours if you have less of a plan. I, feel like. I agree. I agree. And I get to be sort of defined by where I'm at right now, which is like working yeah. on book one taught me so much about drawing that now I can chat. I challenge myself with book two in like interesting ways because of it. And with book three, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's, I'm a different person than I was when I was working on, on Clementine book one. And it's great cool. to, it's great to change. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about the art style in particular, because I really felt a real evolution of it in the second book. The first yeah. book, Mind you, for anybody who hasn't read it, it's very snowy, so there's a lot of white backgrounds <laughs> and things that are washed out. So, I mean, my life this, is so easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, but versus here, which is set by the sea, so just setting-wise, it's very different. But it also felt like there was a very conscious effort to make thicker inking lines throughout, lean into that a little bit more, particularly with the characters. They seem to pop off the background a little bit. Is that something that you aimed for? You know, it's not something I could have defined, but it it like it happened that way. When I was drawing the first page, inking the first page of book two, I could already tell I was like, these lines are, are like a little thicker and I don't know why. And like mm -hmm. something about this book is just like a little bit different, but you don't have time to interrogate or understand yourself in this process. You're just like, I'm going to, I'm going to just keep drawing. I don't know if I accidentally picked up the wrong pen could have happened easily. <laughs> um, all my pens, it is not clear which size is which. Um, but yeah, the, this, it totally evolved stylistically. And now I'm really curious, like what's going to happen with book three. Yeah. I think that the stylistic evolution is something you should lean into as an artist. I know some people really, um, think about cohesion in their art. Like they really want like the characters to look the same on every page. My characters don't look the same on every page because I don't really care. It's like, if you yes. can tell that it's the same character, then that's fine. Because it's like this, this is a hand drawn book, obviously everything. And I don't draw digitally. So it's like, it is truly hand drawn. Um, so it's like that, that level of, um, I don't know, of everything looking just like a little bit different, I think is fascinating. Well, I agreed. Like, I feel like we consistency feels a little bit. I think we're ready for progression. Uh, yeah. And uh, like a movie that the the, uh, the Cross the Spider Verse, I think, proves that like people can tolerate variation in so many different art styles happening at once if it so supports true. the story. And that's just I think that's so much more exciting because then I feel choice, and that's what I want. In stories like, oh, they this is an intentional idea that was brought in here. The polar opposite of that is like Hergé, who did Tintin spent his entire life redrawing old Tintin to make it look wow. like new Tintin. Wow. And I learned that about that like at comic school. And that's when I was like, I am not going to be Hergé. That is crazy. <laughs> I mean, you could sell it as Clementine is slowly coming into her own, right? She's growing up and yeah. becoming more defined as a person. Mm -hmm. Um one, you mentioned this or touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's this interesting thing also uh, from watching every single Walking Dead thing where they get to a new place and you know there's that inevitability of like, oh, this place seems okay. So <laughs> finally <laughs> settled down here. Yeah, it's something's going to be terrible. So given that, you, I know you said you like working in a formula, but since you've got that thing, how do you work around that inevitability? How do you still build the tension in the situation knowing this place is going to fall at some point. Uh, it's so hard. It's so, so hard. I think that all you can do is you can manipulate 
how a place falls and how it makes you feel, how it interacts with the characters. It's like, it's the details. It's the details we can, yeah. we can like we can change and fiddle with. And it's the details where you can surprise um, mm. people. And I think that my hope is that at the end of the trilogy, I can, I'm hoping to kind of flip that script a little bit and see what, what I can do there really to like change this idea that everywhere in the world is just going to disintegrate. Because I think at a certain point, that's just not going to be true. People are going to be too good at this mm -hmm. and have really figured out like campfires, but <laughs> really, no, it's, it's super hard. I, I definitely, and my, my editor and I struggle with this where we're like, we're trying so hard not to be formulaic, but there's also nothing wrong with the formula because mm -hmm. Like apocalyptic stories follow a certain mode because it's a literal apocalypse. Like, obviously things are going to be hard, and what's going to change is that things are going to get harder. I mean, I have to say one of the things that I really appreciate, and the other guys make fun of me for saying this sometimes, but particularly about Clementine Book One, and without getting to spoilers, Clementine Book Two, you spend a lot of time on resource management, which is such a big I deal. A no, I love it. I do love it because, like, obviously, I love the emotion <laughs> and I love like the zombie action and everything. But the fact that they're like, how do we manage? How do we manage the amount of crops we have? And if we do this thing, we can't do this other thing. And how do we keep oh it all God. together? It's Alex, great. let me. Let me tell you what yeah. I wanted book two to be and what they did not let me have book two oh, be yeah. because it's okay. too boring. <laughs> I wanted all of book two to be about cholera and composting toilets. What? <laughs> the dream. Because I couldn't stop. I, I got stuck after I finished book one. I was like, where is everyone going to the bathroom? All these zombies, they kill them right where they are and they fall and decompose. That mixes with the human shit. It gets in the water source. Suddenly everyone has cholera. Wow. And my, and my editor was like, What's the who's the villain of book two? And I was like, Cholera. Disorganization. No waste management. Someone from a sanitation department oh about my God. hours. And and all that wow. I was book two is there is a little bit about I think composting toilet at some point, but yeah. that's the real enemy of The Walking Dead. Is wow, the, I agree. Waste management. Come on. Wait, wait. I want to. So when you talk to the person in waste management for hours, did they have any like they were like, well, you know, uh, this oh, is what we would do. Like she was first of all, she was thrilled because nice. normally normally people do not want to talk to her about sanitation. I oh, did, cool. and she was like. The zombie apocalypse is the perfect opportunity to restart waste management because she was like, it makes no sense that we use clean water in toilets. What a waste. What? And I was like, she was blowing my mind. She was like, there are new ways to do this. She explained to me exactly how to deal with toilets in the apocalypse. So I am I live in Vermont in the woods. I'm ready. I'm oh, ready. wow. Nice. Great. And after the apocalypse, there's going to be no <laughs> no waste in our water because i know where to put the composting toilet um oh my God. but yeah she was yeah. she was thrilled it was so much fun obviously the book is not about human shit it's about <laughs> clementine <laughs> and, darn and people and blah 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 but in its initial iteration that is what this book was about that's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. This is obviously a big wide world, not just in terms of the Telltale games, but every yeah. character and every setting in The Walking Dead. Is there any temptation to bring in any of those familiar things, or is it very specifically about taking it in its own direction? No, I want to get like further and further from everybody. On the map of The Walking Dead, I'm like, go further, further, get new country, <laughs> go far, far. Um, yeah, I, I only want to expand it further and I and I but I also feel like everyone else working on The Walking Dead and all its iterations right now like that's their baby they know what they're doing they should you know they should enjoy their segment of the universe and I'm just gonna like frolic up in Canada <laughs> well I love it uh so Clementine book two is coming out in October you're working on book three presumably yep. that would be next year you think sometime or not 100 percent sure yeah it'll be next year I'll okay. just I'll just like I'll just like push the baby to the side and do it <laughs> oh yeah that thing too you do have I'll that other out. project that other project yeah you got yeah. two yeah, babies you late, that's why yeah. okay uh, and legit. actually sorry I missed this this is a question from YouTube are there other universes you'd like to play in Oh God, you know, honestly, I'm ready to go back to to universes of my own creation for a little while. Yeah. And I think that's that's honestly just 
because, because of fandom. I'm ready to like be secure with a group of people who have no baggage about the world I'm, I'm working within. Yeah. Nice. Understandable. Great. Regardless, the Clementine books are great with yeah, that. Getting into any spoilers. Book two is phenomenal as well. I absolutely yes. loved it. And so good. The amount so of good. tension and emotion in it is great. Um, very excited for people to check it out and uh, good luck with the baby as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And thank yes. you for the cocktail recipe. Absolutely. We'll send yes. it on. Hold you can on try it. it in six months. Three months. Three, Three months. months. Oh, Alex. my gosh. Alex, she's six months in. So I'm so. not a doctor. <laughs> I don't right. know how these things work. Long. You're right. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Tilly. Uh, Justin, thanks Pete, everyone. if you could explain how babies work, that would be great. Yeah, we'll do no that problem. Uh, yeah, we definitely. You see, a couple children overdue, but definitely. Yeah, thank you, Tilly. <laughs> thanks, Tilly. All right. There we go. Oh, Once again, God. Clementine Book 2 is yeah. coming out in so good. October. So good. I believe the exact dates at the current time, October 4th in comic book shops on October 10th in bookstores, so definitely check it out. 10-4 out the door. Yeah. Oh, I did want to bring in one other thing before we cut to our next section here. If you give me a second, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, this is from Alex Believe, sent it yes. through what he mentioned. Obviously, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, we're not going to get it here. Oop, I uploaded the wrong thing. Hold on, you guys, Ben, for a second. Oh, hey. Oh, that was oh, Alex was about there. to there. Hey, oh, A lot of bamping. times, Pete, what? When you vamp, you don't say vamping quite. Oh, vamp, vamp, vamp. oh go. my God! Look at that. Yeah, this is the uh, do. For anybody who's listening, this is the Doom picture that Alex believe was the first to. thing that he drew in the. Yeah, it's gorgeous. The, uh, yeah. Not apocalypse. His first pandemic. rage. His yeah. first uh, something he hadn't already worked a character he hadn't already done before, and that's a sick Doom. And we should I, say, if you're listening to the podcast, you can always find our uh the videos online so you don't have yeah. to you can go yeah. and scan through and find this very yeah check him out and, and what we also know from talking with him is that he poses first before he does his pictures so he did this and then uh, you, you think he cut somebody with a sword and then he held it because no, that's no. a reference no, I you he saw him the, hold the uh, daredevil pose, and you could right. tell like he was doing it just like the picture. So he, he I think, think he, he does like him first instead of a sword like a mom. Oh, I think yeah, what he did was he, or maybe he had pen. an explosion uh, when he was trying to cast a magical spell in his uh, college dorm room, and it exploded into his face. And then he pulled out a full suit of armor and cursed that infernal Richards. Wow, uh, that it's, I like the idea of Doom in his dorm room having like a. Uh, hot noodle hot pot explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Richards, uh, my poor little face is burned by this ramen. All right, why don't we move on to our next section, which is my favorite section because you all make it up. It is your audience question. All yeah. right. Yeah, Justin and, leads for this part. We all know uh, Yeah, that. Justin's not here. He doesn't take questions. No yeah, questions. No yeah. questions. He's going to the beer the for... He's going to no the fridge for more beer. Time. Yeah, no questions, just beer. Uh, we are taking questions pretty much anywhere online except for Twitter because they don't do that. So if you're watching live, feel free to throw out a question about absolutely anything. But in the meantime, I'm still working on this Clement which is very delicious. I didn't mention that before. Uh, I yeah. loved it. And you, you're, if you've seen the recipe, it's gin and tequila, something where you're like, that doesn't make a ton of sense. But there's something what about those two coming together mm -hmm. and mixing with the clementine uh, oh, yeah. juice that really makes a nice, even drink. Stray Bullies it. is always is killing it. And uh, thank you so much, Stray, for putting that together. It's a uh, quality. Yes. Uh, what quality are you guys drinking, one. Pete? You're still working on your beer, Justin. Yep. You grabbed um, your beer. I finished my Clementine, and I've got a ruby red Kolsch from our friends Ooh. at Genesee. Ooh. Yeah, uh, Genesee, what's up? And this is, uh, they have these seasonal specialties, and I shop at Wegmans in Brooklyn, my upstate <laughs> grocery store, oh, yeah. Shouts, and Wegmalandos. The corner, they've got 12 packs of uh, the Genesee uh, seasonal specials, and they are amazing, and at the price, his nice. I tell you, what's what's nice is even in the Wegmans in Baltimore, I'm still getting stuff from Rochester. I can get dinosaur barbecue sauce. I can get oh, country yeah, sweet. I mean, it's uh, it's it's all the great things of home right there. Uh, I don't know if you're a mustard guy, but Nance's mustard that they have at Wegmans. If you're not eating this, this is the number one mustard in the universe. <laughs> wow. Get your hands on it. It's you're a, a mustard sweet, guy. I just go classic yellow. That's all I really uh, mess with. You got to change your game. Classic yellow? What are yeah. you? A 1920s baseball game attendee? Get in the, <laughs> get in the game. Get yeah. in the mustard game. Uh, we got a bunch of questions here, but I want to start off with this one because 
<laughs> that made me laugh. This is from Pablo. If any of you were about to die tomorrow, what comic would you read and why? So oh, you have wow. 24 hours to live. Great what, question. Do you think Pablo. you stopped to read a comic? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would read a couple. Hey, oh. Pablo, what do you know? A couple? Yeah, exactly. What do you know about that? I, mean, I probably going down wouldn't tomorrow? read just one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'd probably I'd be like, go oh, back. Are we, are we taping the stack? In which case, I probably need to read those comics first. I'd to probably finish. go back to one of my favorites if I'm about to die. So I would go with Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Read that one more time before I keel over. You know what I mean? Hmm. Bring me to a happy place. Um, so just to check in this scenario, like, I know I'm going to die in 24 hours. Right. My yeah, kids are like, yeah. please, Daddy, don't go. And I'm like, no, no, I have to read one comic. That's right. Pablo D. Martinez yeah. told me to. Yeah, why, why do you have a problem with this setup? Just answer the fucking question. I feel so, like, Alex, I feel like if you'd be like, kids, I'm dying, they'd be like, well, can we read the latest Avengers? Or what's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what about comics? next week's DC? Do we still, yeah. Yeah, can we get your password to your email so we can get all your cop copies? The Superman for all seasons is probably what I'd read. I know that's oh. my answer a lot of times, but it's just this hopeful, beautiful thing thing and i feel like being able Good to answer. look at those paintings one last time that tim sale did to treat the question seriously that would that would make me happy that's in really my nice. final hours oh, nice. you could just watch the Zack snyder superman stuff it's sort of the same same deal yeah. uh which we yeah i guess lately. with my last four hours i'd watched <laughs> the snyder cut <laughs> yeah. yeah but before 24 hours, that, you gotta throw four yeah. you gotta throw four in there release the cut <laughs> absolutely absolutely um i'm gonna take it back to I would read a little bit of Sandman, a little mm -hmm. Sandman World's End stuff, some of my favorite original comics. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Just a touch, and then I got to jump into some Starman. Got the full, Ooh, I got wow. all 80, 81 ish issues. Uh, oh, so you're those. ignoring your kids. You're straight up, you're not like one yeah. comic. You're like, Daddy's you're busy. Like, yeah, Daddy's <laughs> busy for a while. Listen, I'm sorry. I've been solo parenting for one month, so like, <laughs> I'm, I can die now in general. So, uh... <laughs> all right, great question there. Love that one. Uh, this is from Derek Madehart. How many of your guests do you think are on ecstasy? I'd say Ooh. All, all of them. Well, I would we say nail them ecstasy. Yeah, yeah as yeah. part of the at least two percent. We want to loosen everybody up. Everyone wants to be a little loose. Plus, Plus, Justin's always working on his ecstasy. You know what I mean? He has a good mixture. He likes to try out different yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's like Breaking Bad, but it's like more fun. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, Remember breaking. that one? It was like all the paprika. That was really something. Yeah, it's like breaking rad. Can mm -hmm. I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I just <laughs> pictured you on a BMX bike for some yeah. reason. Oh, <laughs> said, I, I do all my chemistry um, on a half bike. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Danny Heck says, are you guys looking forward to the Ahsoka show? Have you seen any of the animated stuff that appears to be heavily featured in the series? What do you think about that? Um, I am looking forward to it. We've had a real Star Wars gap, I think. I mean, Mando was what it was. A series that... The greatest! Uh, we had our uh, ta different takes on it. I did think that the last... Since the second to last episode was pretty good, and so I'm ready to see a new take, and it's uh, that's what's coming next. So I'm I'm here for it, and I have seen a little bit of the animated stuff, but that's one thing I want to do this summer is go back and really watch. Hmm. Yeah, I like the animated stuff. That it got me uh, very excited for what this is going to be, uh, and I have high hopes. Um, so hopefully, it's going to be amazing. Uh, I'm a little trepidatious about it, to be honest, because I haven't seen most of the animated stuff i just don't love the animation style there's something about it that puts me off a little bit i know people love Ooh. it and i know the, it's great really for, for clone wars and rebels i watched the first season of rebels i thought it was very good but i was definitely fighting with like the way the mouths move and everything it just feels very blocky to me i don't know classic something about it. and my it worry about the ahsoka show is that it is going to be like uh, this is for the fans thing, which will be great for the fans, but I don't want to feel like I have to have done my homework and watched six seasons of Clone Wars and four seasons of Rebels to understand what's going on in Ahsoka. Well, I wow. will say, I I, I ha share that sort of trepidation, but I also think with this, I feel like they know it's a smaller pool of people, so they're going to do the, the diligence to like. Yeah, they're not going to make it inaccessible. Yeah, the, Star Wars has never made anything inaccessible. You're damn <laughs> right, <laughs> people. Uh, this is from Frederico Rosa. How's your hype for Secret Invasion and The Flash? 
Well, well, let's be careful here, right, Alex? Sure. Uh, I saw the Stop. Clapping. What's with you in the pointing today? Why are you always pointing at people? What's up, man? That's rude. Don't point. I'm it's not rude. pointing at anybody. Do, I'm yeah. pointing at myself. All right. Stop pointing at me, bro. Uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I saw it. the flash last night. And, oh! Yeah. And I, <laughs> wow! Stop cool, cool. Get hot on the Wait. Uh, are you and serious? The, yeah, I saw the flash last night. Wait, wait. Screening. Yes. Like was it at like a press screening where everybody was assholes and not looking up from their notepads? No, it was, or was a fan it like a screen. real? It was a fan real. screening. <laughs> you want to wow. hear something hilarious? I won a radio contest. <laughs> no, I love it. I did. You listen to, you're, you're you're like, to the you radio? Come, you come, no. When you come to the box office, they were like, "Tell them radio winner," and I was like, "All right," and I did. And Wait, who said that? Where did the where, radio? Station. So where were you Can listening he, to the radio? Do you have a I car? Wasn't, it was an online thing. I was like, sure, I'll try this out. I, I'm curious to see it. I don't want to pay to see this movie. And then I won. <laughs> I love it. And it's so funny. And I feel bad. I normally from, I normally yeah, never do this exactly. thing because uh-huh. I'm like. Oh, I normally from, never I, do this. No, I from, legitimately don't. I would rather a regular person who doesn't get free stuff all the time get to see something. But I legitimately did not want to pay to see this movie. And I hadn't seen a press screening, so I was like, I'll try this out. And again. Uh, Derek Maynard says, a radio contest, are you from the 1940s? Uh, potentially. But I, I, I will say, it's very, from Pete's point of view especially, I feel like it's funny that you're like, uh, that you, who gets it to see a lot of stuff early, mm-hmm. <laughs> seeing it early and it's completely under different auspices. <laughs> but stupid. enough of this. Give us the take. Pete, do you want any sort of review? Or you uh, don't you there? fucking dare. I can take off my thing if you want to do it, though. Headphones? Those are what the, yeah. That's what that's yeah. called. Yeah, you can yeah. take it off. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's very bad. It's a bad movie. Ah, I knew it. <laughs> there you go. That's so uh, funny. Well, but it, it's not just to qualify the badness, because that's sort of not fun to hear. How does it rank against sort of the Snydery stuff? Uh, so I'll, I'll frame up one thing that I'll say just like right off about it is... Certainly, I have a problem with the fact that Ezra Miller is a criminal who seems to be forgiven for all of their crimes. So that's definitely makes it a little hard to get into their character when you're watching it. Um, but also, like, the plot's all over the place. The tone is all over the place. A large chunks of the movie feel to me, and this is not me being snarky. Legitimately, I was like, what is happening here? Like, they decided to make a live-action Looney Tunes sequel to Man of Steel like a direct Mm. sequel to it, which is weird. Like, totally, it's a strange thing to watch. Well, and let me say, like, we've been rewatching Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Justice League for for our our Sons of a Gun podcast, just getting ready for The Flash. And it's all those movies, the tone's all over the place. They're super chaotic. Uh, Watching Justice League, the characters feel like they don't want to be in the same room together, Mm -hmm. and Flash particularly feels like a strange iteration, especially given all the the TV series stuff, which feels a little bit more composed. Without, I'm not going to do any spoilers because I'm sure people will enjoy this movie and that's fine and that's great and I want to get Pete back on his headphones at some point. But the, not only is the tone all over the place, the movie does one of my least favorite things, which I think like comes from script tinkering or something where it's characters are like, that's it, I'm leaving forever. And then two scenes later, they're like, I'm back, how can I help? And Mm, it's just like, that's the arc. That is the arc of your entire movie. Why are you doing that? The nostalgia Easter egg stuff goes from like just wincy to downright ghoulish at certain points. I can't wait. Oh my God. That's the kind of stuff. Because now that we know, we're almost done, Pete, just one second. Uh, The the way that it, uh, this movie has been hyped and so positively uh, talked about and the fact that it is sort of continuing, I think is not that I'm looking forward to it being bad, Mm-hmm. But I feel like this movie is going to be the final punctuation mark on this period for DC. So. Yeah, I I was uh, I I just really didn't like it at all. Um, I think a lot of people are going to see this, and maybe I mean this derisively. I want to say I don't mean this derisively, but a lot of people were like clapping at the movie theater, and I think it's just nostalgia stuff and yeah, that's it that's and they're fine. like I love it, a lot well a lot of the movie felt like a stand-up comic being like hey remember this do you remember this thing you remember pogs yeah. you remember jolt cola and i was like I yes i remember that could you add something else to it all right that's it 
So he's Dude, slow you the got, whole time. You're you guys, slow. Uh, you guys weren't talking about the movie the whole time, were you? That was a long ass fucking time. We're talking about the Pete documentary we're making. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Good luck. Uh, with that. But the other part of this question though was how hyped are we for Sacred Invasion? So I've seen the first two episodes of that. Jesus and, Christ, man! <laughs> and it, sorry, I, there was a radio contest. Not, there was a radio. Not, co- I want a radio you, contest. Stop you not wanna, flexing on us. What the you, f? You want a state fair? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ping pong. They guessed your weight. You did the. Uh, yep. Uh, no, but I actually can't say anything about that. It's still embargoed for an hour, so maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll talk about it on the Week in Geek or something. Maybe but, we will. But what about you guys? Regardless of what I think and all my nut flexing, I guess, are you hyped for the Flash or are you hyped for Secret Invasion? Well, I I wasn't hyped for the Flash, but then uh, you know uh, my Batman's going to be there, so now I am hyped for the Flash. Uh, Secret Invasion, I'm. Very curious because, as we know, the comic book uh, squirrels are evil, but in the Marvel universe, squirrels are the good guys. So, how the fuck are they going to do Secret Invasion? And so, how do they put all those nuts in their cheeks? <laughs> squirrels? Squirrels? Did, that's what you uh, squirrels? Did I say right. squirrels? Or was you said I said squirrels several times. Same thing. Did, Same did thing. I really? Oh, uh, <laughs> no. I mean, the uh, Pete has I'm nuts. Drunker than right I thought now. it was. It's just one <laughs> beer. The heavy beer. The thing is, uh, Pete, I feel, because I had the same concern, and uh, we talked about the, um, in the Marvel News podcast that we did, Alex and I, earlier this week, we talked about the the trailer bit that was released, sort of in secret, Mm -hmm. that I don't know if you checked out, and that got me super hyped because it is very much setting up that it's very secret invasion. And I haven't seen the first two episodes, so I can talk about the fact that I'm very excited for that, and I feel like that's what, what they're going to pay off with this series very hyped yeah but how are they going to do the twist then i think it's not going to be as many there aren't going to be a ton of heroes that are uh squirrels i think it'll be or they're all squirrels i think there's going to be a that 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 would be a weird reveal if everybody in the entire series is squirrels they're like wait you're also a squirrel i'm a squirrel you want to hang out? Yeah, yeah and then the sound movie. guy's like, I'm a squirrel. And then you're like, whoa, this is getting weird. <laughs> yeah. They do a whole uh, breaking through the movie set and Muppet yeah. movie type thing at the end. Yeah. Be, I love that. Statler and Waldo over there, but they're squirrels. Yeah. yeah. Villains on Tuesday says, favorite comic that got turned into a movie besides Sin City. Feels like that's a given. <laughs> wow. Uh, Strong take. Taking away all of our fun bits there, <laughs> Villains on a Tuesday. Yeah, ooh, what do you think, from though? Downtown. Like, I, just to give some parameters here, and this is making it hard for myself because I don't have an answer, but direct, like, comic-to-screen adaptation, like a Sin City. Not like, I love Superman so much as something something that was a comic that was adapted for screen. Yeah, I guess I would say this probably takes out MCU, DCU, and is more mm-hmm. about a comic that, uh, unless there's like a very specific. I comic mean, Scott arc. Scott Pilgrim uh, was yeah. a great one that I really great. loved, uh, and I saw the uh, other version uh, where and he was with Knives, which I thought was a better, better version. We'll see what That'd happens in the anime. Part. By the way, pretty excited about that. Yes, I'm well. very excited about Maybe that. They'll correct. I don't the think anime. they're going to go with the he goes with knives version. Come on! Just uh, off the off the jump, that was a crazy uh, fact that that happened. I mean, this is recency bias, but I got to throw it to Spider-Verse. you're very recency biased. That's all you I do. Love is you're like the you know newest the thing? thing, newest thing. Because you know, new stuff is fun. Yep. Often, often, because we just saw it. Yeah. Uh, I don't road think to, that road counts. to perdition. Yeah, road to perdition. Ghost world. There you go. Um, Constantine. Let's see. Uh, ooh, here's a good one. I don't have an answer for this, but maybe somebody else says Chris Burden coming to NJ. Oh, I guess I do have an answer to this. I just read New Jersey coming to New Jersey, NYC area in July. Any good places to dig for old seventies comics? Cheap, beat up reader copies are especially great. Ooh. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I wish. Uh, longtime fan, predominant icon Nat Towson was in the mm-hmm. chat because he goes to this crazy like warehouse. Warehouse, yeah. yeah. It's all just rows and rows of. It's uh, actually a couple boxes. of blocks away from me, not to blow up my address, but it's around. Oh, like, Jesus Christ! With this guy, <laughs> it's not a I I found out about it on a radio contest. It's a couple of blocks away in Sunset Park near Industry City. Um, just search for like comic book warehouse and it'll come up on Google. 
I have never actually been in it. I went with my kids once and we were like, is this it? This is like a dirty door. And we looked up and it was like a dark staircase to dirty nowhere. Dirty door. And we <laughs> decided, nope, we're going to go somewhere else. We're going to do something else. Goodbye. Uh, but Nat says it's good. So there you go. Cool. I do want to go there. Maybe we should make a little excursion. Um, mm, to die. Go... An excursion yeah. to die. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, if you're working from home, coming up. Let's go. I'm there ready. You go. All right, we'll make it happen. Uh, and also, Midtown Comics has their own warehouse in yes, Astoria. Yes, they do. I want to yes. say, yeah. um, check out their website because I don't know if this will time out for when you're going to be there, but they have sales all the time. And I will say, they often have summer sales. Yeah, and also you can like call the shop and explain like what you're looking for because they have those big warehouses. They might be able to steer you in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Kevin, which I believe in improv terms is known as pimping. Uh, this is, how do you think you've changed as a podcaster, either improved or regressed, <laughs> since you've been doing this or since you switched to online? <laughs> which is something that we were discussing pretty heavily in our Patreon Slack and give <laughs> yeah. answers to today. Yo, Patreon you know, Slack's been getting hot, dude. A lot of, a lot of mm-hmm. stuff going down in there. A lot of, we have been talking about the New York comedy scene, weirdly, a lot in there, and it's yeah. been fun. But let me say, uh, I think... We've, I think we've changed a lot because it's very different to do this as a live show versus to do it online. The literal rhythm is different because we are talking with on different videos, a little different delays on it, and the way that I feel like we react is different uh, in, a, in an interesting way. And just comedic timing is different when you're doing a live stream show because you have to really be a little bit more buckled in because of the different Wi-Fi nature of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's that. There's also... A couple of other things that I was mentioning on the Slack. I don't know how interesting this is for people, but I think being aware of versus you guys sitting next to me on stage and feeling that energy, being able to see your faces, but also looking around and judging it, also seeing my own face, that changes how you do things because you're very aware of that. And also, at least on my end, editing all the podcasts. I don't like listening to my voice, but listening to my voice a lot and hearing the yeah. rhythms of it and where my pauses are and my verbal tics and everything, I don't know that they've necessarily gotten better, but it's certainly something that I think about a lot and try to be aware of. Well, yeah. I do think, though, sorry, Pete, just off of what you said, Alex, I think um, the being talking into a mic is different than being on stage. We have, you know, 20, 25 years of experience being a performer where I feel like you don't, we don't um as much, we don't pause as much when we're on stage because of those innate instincts. Yeah. And here we're a little bit more like in a Laid room back. just talking, yeah, just just talking like being so. on the phone more. So I think it, it is a sort of a different energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a different energy. I definitely think I've regressed uh, since we've started kind of working from as home. If you, Yeah, as a person, as a performer. I touch my face, say ums, all these kind of horrible things where... Um, as a performer, we're feeding more off of the live audience and performing the for them. Yeah, miss the audience big time. But I also, um, because they will kind of g- gauge what the humor is going to be, where you guys regress into your bullshit a lot. <laughs> and because I can't punch you, you're bolder, which is upsetting. Because when I was sitting next to you, I could let you guys have it what? when you stepped out of fucking you line. <laughs> you, you know, so about? this is like, it's this a different kind of thing. False memory that you were like, threatening us you were the bully of the show like we <laughs> deviated from the line, itinerary like the dominatrix or something like that I yeah that. i was like pete walk on my back it makes me feel alive when you walk on my back <laughs> uh well cool thank you kevin appreciate that uh this is from michael tillman I knew this is gonna come up at some point any thoughts on the yeah. hashtag comics broke me reports from comic creators if people are not super online i'll lay out what this is uh this is due to A guy, I believe his name is Ian McGinty, who was a comic creator and a cartoonist. He, it has not been specified how he died, but he was 38 years old, so he was very young. And there was a conversation that got sparked off of his death about how comics wear people out, wring them out, like take absolutely everything from them. Um, There's a great report, as usual, on the beat Heidi McDonald site where she breaks down everything about this trend and like the initial controversy about it because people are like, whoa, 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 we don't know how Ian died. Don't use his death as an excuse to talk about how bad comics is. But apparently his mom was like, yeah, he worked 24 hours a day for 38 years. He got completely strung out. There is 
nothing that he had left in the tank. And so there's so many people that, frankly, I think, like, are being... And, and I think this is almost the best thing that's come out of it rather than, you know, some people are using it as an opportunity to complain or like name names or whatever. Yeah. But the salary transparency stuff that's coming out of editors in particular and people in editorial is very important. Uh, calling out yeah. the fact that like people who worked at Marvel who were editors and senior editors are getting like $30,000 a year, which is not really enough money to live in New for York anything. for anything. Um, and they're working on like six books a month, top tier books that are selling hundreds of thousands of copies. And that's what they're getting. Um, that to me was very fascinating. I think like the other stuff, and this is not to deride it at all, but the other stuff where artists and writers are talking about it, that's been covered a lot. So this is more like doubling down on this is so bad for artists and writers, but this is really the first time I've seen editors come out and be like, also on editorial, this is very bad. Well, I think yeah. it's uh, it, uh, just, I haven't been able to sound off on this uh, on Slack or anything. So if you don't mind, like Please. this to me um, is, 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 is it's a part of kind of like getting to see behind the curtain, because for me, this kind of made me think of television, like television broke me. I went to school for television, worked yeah. in television for many years. Then I finally uh, worked for Wife Swap and that show broke me and I never worked in television again. And so it's just one of these things of like learning about trying to do something that's creative artistic in this a kind of business company world where there's all these stupid rules and all these stupid regulations and all these things that you don't think about when you are young and have dreams and have things that you want to try to do and things like comic books things like working in television where you want to try to do some artistic and say something and and uh, use your voice and try to kind of do different things and then you kind of learn about all the other stuff and it's rough man it is rough no yeah. matter what kind of industry you're going in that kind of like learning about the behind the scenes of it all, you know, can can be just be crushing. So it's yeah, it's tough whether we're talking about comics, talking about like a lot of different things. It's just one of those things where it's uh it's tough when you kind of learn about the behind the scenes. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah. no, no, I was just jumping off what you're saying, which I think is great and very true. Like I continue to work in television and I think there are a lot of jobs that are like that even now like I still encounter jobs where I'm like oh that's what you think I'm worth for you and you know what the demands are going to be but I do think comics is is unique in that it there aren't really any unions unions even if you're not in a union like the writers guild any union top to bottom crew uh creative whatever it is in television film, like they pull the whole industry up because they establish standards that even a, a show that is what I would call a garbage show when it comes to not a value on the content, but a, the way they treat the people who work on it, both in front of the camera and behind, it, they have to bring their, their standards up a little bit because otherwise they will be spotlighted and, and punished for it. Comic comic industry doesn't have that there are no unions supporting it in any capacity so there's no way for people to really protect themselves and i think this hashtag is what if you haven't checked it out it's super sad and depressing yeah but like to look at that because in so much of what we hear about the industry is people talking about their books as labors of love something they've done and passionate about big creative expression for them but you don't see the dark side of what you, people are willing to do to make that happen and not be sort of compensated for it in any capacity. So, I don't know. It, it's it's tough to read all that stuff. I, it's important that we know about it, and hopefully, it will lead to just exposing it is valuable in that it can lead to change for the better. Absolutely. And the other thing that I'd throw out there, though, that I think is probably very important about this hashtag that's come out here that probably is abundantly apparent to absolutely anybody, but. There's this feeling in the comic book industry that you can be replaced at literally any point for any reason whatsoever. And that is something that has been borne out by the fact that even the legends of the industry eventually are like, yeah, 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 you're too old. You know, uh, you sorry, yeah. you can't work here anymore. Or they get thrown a bone for some sort of things. And I think there has been forward momentum there in terms of particularly with DC and Marvel trying to... <laughs> throw more bones to people in a in a positive way i would say like a lot of a lot of the stuff that marvel's doing and i have no inside knowledge of the process but the fact that like 
they are keeping these legacy style books that we've been talking about where like Chris Claremont and Anne Decenti and all of these other people. I do think that is an attempt by editorial to be like, we can't just leave these people behind. We There have been yeah. too many stories of older creators who die destitute, like with the zero dollars to their name. That is at the most callous level, a bad look for the company, but it's also making you a bad human being. So, well, and just no, like ahead. on Please. that specifically, the, the, like comics were started as like basically the an art form akin to like drawing the maze in the back of a cereal box. It was mm-hmm. hyper disposable, like not really something that people were like, there's value in from that point to now where our entire mass media culture, film and television is literally maintained by comic books. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you can't throw these people away the way you used to when it was something that was disposable art. Now this is the thing that keeps movie theaters open. It keeps everything buoyed across all of the entertainment industry. So like you have to and you see it and it's the smallest steps to take care of these people even a little bit the the greats who are aging out and aren't being as creative anymore but need support because like they didn't they came up at a time where there weren't any safeguards for them to have a life and you know not to say like they need their charity cases because you know we all have to get by and we all have to make our choices but no, there, but there, legitimately, a, of... a lot of them, not a lot of them, but some of them are. And I think, like you're saying, yeah. it's that disparity between Ooh, the Flash might only make $70 million this weekend <laughs> yeah. versus some comic creator who wrote multiple issues of the Flash being like, hey, I'm dying in a hospital bed and I have no money to pay my hospital bills, yeah. no health insurance. I Can came up with the speed me? force. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I am dying. (laughs) And I know we're laughing about this, but this literally is like the sort of thing that's happening all the time in the comic book industry. And it's insane. And like, it can only, I can only imagine how much exacerbates things, let alone the fact that comic creators, and we've talked to so many of them have to be like, we ask from a fan perspective, we're like, wow, isn't that so exciting? The spot was on screen and it's crossed the spider verse. How cool was that? And they're like, the person who created the spot that we're talking to is like, so great. I found out about that when I saw the trailer. Yeah. Sobbing. <laughs> yeah. it, it's a terrible system. It's awful. It, it, something does need to change. I don't know that a hashtag is going to change things, but like I said at the beginning, the absolute most important thing about it is it's people being transparent and open about this. So it's not going to change DC. It's not going to change Marvel. They're not going to be like, you know what? We're not big companies anymore. We care about people now. But it is going to make other people more aware how other people are being treated and how they can uh, advocate for themselves in the future with deals. Yeah, that's well, also why it's so important that you support things on Zoop and all that kind of stuff where it, it yes. goes to the creators, it goes to the people who are making it and and doing it because uh that's that's kind of the the people you need to get going the people who have the dreams and the passion for it well and like to say you know not to this isn't defending marvel and dc but you know all these creators signed a contract saying like the work i do is for you and even in the screenwriting industry like when you are paid for it the creative licenses goes licensing goes to the company like you don't own your scripts yeah, yeah. at the end of the day but you but are that's protected not, in certain ways but that's, that's, that's not, not I'm good not, I'm, it's it's no, like, i'm not saying it's, it's good a, but I mean, you signed your soul away sorry bro you well, know what i mean they didn't have a choice they got, they got a chance to write spider-man which is the coolest thing a person could do with their life so when they're dying of kidney failure at age 23 they'll be like I love you, Spider-Man. Age uh, 23, wow. What I'm saying is, like, the, when the industry starts to change a little bit more and, like, comic books and stories are elevated that are creator-owned, that's when the, that's when we can start to move it to that where there are protections in place for those people going forward. Nice. Uh, regardless, a great question. This is definitely going to be something people are going to be talking about a lot going forward, or at least... I hope they are. This is from David Quinley. Is Transformers 123 worth seeing? I'm leading for <laughs> no, but 70% in Rotten Tomato has to be one of their best ratings. Have oh either of you guys God. seen Rise of the Beasts? And if so, will the beasts ever stop rising? The Beast Wars is where I kind of like bowed out of Transformers. So, well, and uh, that's what's crazy because that's where I was like, Beast Wars is legit. The Beast yeah. Wars animated series, I loved. Smart, interesting ideas. And I've heard the takeaway from this movie is that it actually is interesting and they do a lot of like fun twists and turns. So, I don't know is if I'm going to run out. I'm not going to run out and see this movie, but like, 
I do want it. It's definitely the one I'm excited to see. And I wow. have not seen a single Transformers movie. Not even the first one? Sorry, no. I, I this is legitimately, I have a question. I don't know anything about this. Are Optimus Primal and Optimus Prime the same person? In the Beast Wars television program, they were. Okay, uh, but they this, adapted, they seem to be talking to each other. I think they're different people in this movie. Someone mm. in the chat has seen it will uh, answer. <laughs> and by but people, I, I mean Gorilla and Trump. Wait, wait, wait. So yeah, Kevin yeah. says <laughs> we saw it today and it was okay. It mm. was dot, dot, oh, dot, okay. 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 So there well, you go. what a what a glowing, what a rotten tomato from Kevin right there. Uh, no, in in the animated series, it was they there weren't trucks, so they had to become beasts. <laughs> and so the idea is they came to Earth, and they're like, "I shall become a gorilla, the vehicle of choice of the age." Well, back before before people drove in trucks, they drove animals, Ratatouille style. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know if that's true. That's the beast words. What? Haven't you ever seen a painting from the past? People are driving horses and any other animal. And, and so, and so, if you're driving a horse, you're underneath uh, in the hat and steering it. If you want to really do it, the way I would. I mean, I remember Rat Tattooey. He was under the hat. You had to be under the hat to work the controls. So yeah. no, no. And he was okay. always after those Energon crystals, right? Like that was the plot of Rat Tattooey. Nice. Yeah, definitely. He had to uh, communicate with Razor a Beak Eject. Guy. Anyway, uh, this is from Derek Maynard. Pete, could you do a TED Talk about your TV war stories? Oh, yeah. I could definitely do no that. No joke. That would be fun. Because it's crazy that Pete and I worked. Pete worked in TV way before I did and did a ton of, on a ton of different things. I yeah. want to hear those stories. Because I also have a ton of war stories. But we're, we're from two different eras in a way that I would love to com- compare notes. And we don't. we haven't really done that. That would be interesting. That would be fun. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Lo- I would love to hear that. You guys should do that, or I could yeah. prompt you with questions. No, or... you you can do it. You can be there too. Alex. Yeah, you know, I'll be like, <laughs> sounds cool. <laughs> be like, no, yeah. Tell tell me more. Well, yeah. and Alex, well, let me ask you: What's your most? Because you you're in this industry too, in the same way, or at least were. Like, what what's the most TV story that you have? TV. I I never really worked on TV. Like, I write about TV, but I never really worked on TV. Huh. So my most TV story is I didn't do that. But th- we, there's a TV adjacent. I mean, come on. I worked on movies. I worked on uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance for a couple of days. That was pretty nice. nice. I think I've, I think I've told this before, but this really stuck with me. One of my jobs as a PA was uh, copying the script notes. Uh, for Die Hard with a Vengeance, making sure everybody got the scripts. And while I was in the copy machine, I was, of course, reading the script. And one of the notes of the script was, the biggest explosion on the history of film happens. That was oh, one wow. of the directions. And I was Ooh, like, sick. sweet. Can't wait to see that. Sick. <laughs> That's going to be fun. I was on Cash Cabs, if you haven't seen that episode. It's definitely oh, worth, wow. Uh, if you want to see a real child out in the world. I uh, taught uh, improv on Blind Date once. Uh, Derek has an easy question for me. So, Alex, you talked about comics not being an economically viable form of entertainment. How does it survive? Uh, great question. I actually do know the secret. At uh, uh, wait, are you being Darth Vader choked right now? Are you being Darth Vader yeah. choked? Come oh. oh, sorry. I explained all of it, and my uh, feed froze up. It looked like. Oh, oh interesting. Yeah, that yeah, was a classic freeze. Uh, no, real quick. Let's uh, let's save comics. What's your big idea to save comics? What do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if it was that easy, uh, yeah. No, le- legitimately, like I will say, and this is the same thing that I've been saying before for for years at this point, and it's never going to pan out. But I think the devotion to brick and mortar stores. Pete always gets angry at me about this, but is limiting the. F- ways that people can get comics. You've already seen it in terms of things like Webtoon that have a exponentially bigger audience than anything in terms of the print comics that we're doing. So you're saying about. kill print. You're saying print's no, not 100% worth it. 100% not because studies have shown and in fact practice has shown that just making everything available digitally does not take away from print. It is additive because people read it digitally and then they want to buy it in print because they want to have a physical copy of it. So it doesn't actually negatively affect print at all. The same thing happens with movies uh, that people buy it digitally, but then also like if they really love something, they'll buy it physically as well. Like this stuff, 
is not mutually exclusive in any way whatsoever. The thing that they are continuing to do is limit the audience for comic books. And instead, what we've seen, particularly over the past couple of years, is creators, like we were talking about with Zoop, like you brought up with Kickstarter, with other things, they've felt alternate ways of bringing things to a digital audience that have been highly successful. And the big publishers in the industry have slowly been adopting that, some in better ways than others. I do think, like, the thing that we talked to Alex Believe about earlier on, that Marvel was like, hey, we're going to... I would be kind of creeped out if I saw Marvel being like, what's up? We're kickstarting a Deadpool book, you know, or whatever. And you're like, what are you, what are you <laughs> That doing? would be crazy. But Marvel saying, hey, we've partnered with this upper publisher to publish these art books by Alex Maleev and David Mack. That to me, like, that's a cool thing because it's clearly them working with them, granting the rights to the art and bring something forward that might not happen anyway. So those are the sort of things they should be pushing into. They should be pushing into alternate ways of I... getting distribution. And also, sorry, the last thing that I'll say is DC has been way better than this than Marvel, but trying to actually capture different sort of audiences through the art and the writing and the creators, um, particularly with a graphic novel program, that's the way comics should be heading. I just don't understand that nice. after after your movie makes eighty billion dollars, like shouldn't you have to kick it into some kind of like support writer comic fund or some kind of you know what I mean? Like it just seems like they're taking that money and they're not reinvesting it back where they you know got where it's all started. It might be because the executives like. Money and they I, like I, making I, money. Sure. I how do you know? How I, do you know that? I'm not true? trying to I encourage. Don't I don't have a lot of evidence that. for it or anything, but. But think about it this way: you have somebody like David Zaslav, the head of Warner Brothers uh, Discovery, which owns DC Comics. He probably only has a couple of yachts. Like he needs another yacht. He needs to go to. And I don't if, like this bit. If James ne- Tyner the Fourth has to die swipe, for that swipe, to happen, next bit. I'm good with that. Well, a lot of yachts bit. now, a lot of yachts now are um, actually powered by comic book writer blood. So you have to pour it right in there. I thought it was tears. I thought it was tears. Uh, yeah, it's no, both. They change its blood. Yeah. Oh wow, wow, it's getting darker. Uh, th- I don't know why th- this is totally not apropos of this, but I feel like Pete might enjoy this in particular. During Fleet Week, I went to this boat, and it was a British boat, and on the British boat, they had a bunch of pipes outside of their galley, and uh-huh. one of the pipes <laughs> was marked Dirty Water, and another pipe, like, very close to it, was marked Beer, and we asked them about it, they were like, oh yeah, that's the pipe that puts out the beer when we're having parties on deck, and my only question was like, why is it so close to the dirty water pipe, where I'm definitely going to drink too much beer and then go over and have like a glass of dirty water instead. Mm. I, I, love love it's, I love that's, well, that's my weird... nightcap. Oh, <laughs> dirty water. Love that dirty yeah. water. Yeah. Uh, great. Do we have any other home. questions here? Um, oh, here we go. This is from Straight Bullet. Well, it's hunger. What's the solution? Real quick, just around the horn. Um, pay well, comic next... book writers more. Sorry. Yeah. I... What? <laughs> I was going to say, the next time you get one of those genies, instead of asking for more wishes, you just got to say, solve mm. world hunger. And then I mean, I think if we want to solve two problems at the same time, eat comic book writers and artists, and then they'll have less to complain about in terms of their living situations. Well, yeah, but then we won't have great comics because they'll all be dead. Yeah, but that's fine because we'll be full. <laughs> ah, finally Boo. full. <laughs> finally uh, full. Hold on, one last from Derek Mainhart here. Tonight's been one of the best discussions on comics yet. Now, where's the best Wegmans? Great mm. question. Ooh, that's a great I, question. Obviously, Rochester, out. New York, no, where it originated. Was, no, dude. These Wegmans are the best. Rochester, no, no, no. it's like, that's where they, they beta tested it. Then they nailed it. Uh, out, just outside of Syracuse, the DeWitt Wegmans crush. That is a great way. What about Pete? Pete, Pete, I was going to say my only real experiences with Wegmans are Ithaca, New York, and Ithaca. The Ithaca one, I think, is very good. How do you feel as a Wegmans faithful? Well, it's a smaller one, but it is a great. It is a great Wegmans for sure. Um, I like, you know, I like a lot of selection. I like the bigger ones where you got all the different departments, and uh, you know, it's so uh, yeah. They all have those. Whichever one has Nance's mustard, a mu- if you like mustard, <laughs> you gotta get this mustard. <laughs> no, dude, uh, country right. sweet uh, hot sauce—that's where it's at, bro. Uh, folks, that is it for your audience questions. <laughs> and 
Woo. now we're going to move on to our next section, which is trivia. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Pete LePage. All right. It's about freaking time. This is part we get back to the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win $25 to Midtown Comics or Long John Silvers if you want for some uh, reason. Nobody's taken on that, uh, us up on that for a while. Should we change it to something else? Yeah, what else? maybe like what else? Apple, I can't imagine. Applebee's. I- I can't Applebee's. imagine a better meal than Long John Silver's. Mm. Church's Chicken? Uh, sure. White Castle? Yeah, those are all fine. I don't know if they do gift cards. I imagine they do. Anyway, we got a contestant this week, so I'm going to bring them in. Uh, Danny Heck, everybody. Hey! Hey, what's up? Hello. Look at that sweet background. Look at what do we got yeah. going on. Yeah. It's, uh, my boyfriend really wants them to kiss all the time. Oh, mm-hmm. they're holding on screen. They're holding hands. He's not the only Hashtag Stucky. <laughs> Hashtag Stucky. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Pete, <laughs> take it away. All right. Today's trivia is on topical comic news and a small nod to the legend Pat Cooper, R.I.P. Please listen to all three options before making your selection. Here we go. Danny Heck, question number one. Shook, a new black horror anthology comic is coming out next year from blank. Is it A, Dark Horse, B, Go See a Man About a Horse, or C, Lisa Kudrow? So which one of those makes the most sense? And only one of them makes comic books. So <laughs> I'm going to say A. A is correct. Well uh, done. Should be a pretty cool. It's like 200 pages. So, all right, here we go. Question number two. Towards the end of August, Jessica Chen will be writing what DC comic? Is it A, Catwoman, B, The Diamond Dogs, or C, Billy Crystal? I'm also going to say A. Yeah, there you go. All right. You're speaking some Ted Lasso shit. In oh, did somebody catch on? I only took two weeks. All right, here we go. Last one. Who or what is coming back? Hint, it's on the Jean Grey number two cover coming out in September. Is it A, the Phoenix Force, B, Hush Your Butt, or C, Molly Shannon? As much as I would love for it to be Molly Shannon, I'm going to say the Phoenix Force. You are yeah. correct. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Twenty-five uh, free dollars if that's what you would like. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and otherwise, yeah, you have to pay yeah. us twenty-five dollars. Nope. Your choice. No, gotcha. No. Ooh, well, that... in that case, let me get my wallet. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, congratulations! Definitely hit us up. Hit me up on Slack, and I will get you all set up. And Pete, what is your secret movie? Or Danny, do you have a guess? Ooh. Oh, fuck if I know. Uh, Talladega Nights? Oh, all right. Uh, great guess. Love that movie. Uh, I was talking about the 1999 comedy Analyze This. Uh, wow. Nice. That's right. All right, Danny, thank you so much for coming You're... on. Uh, fingers crossed, Stucky will happen at some point. We'll see. Yeah. Still yeah, counting we'll on it. it. Still they just got to lean in a little bit right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. You have it. You have the power. There you go. All right. Thanks, Good night. Yeah, take care. Thanks. Thanks, All right. That's your favorite De Niro role, right? Analyze this? <laughs> no, uh, analyze that. Pete loves that movie more. You can get with this, or you can get with that. Great. As we all know, new comic books are cool, and they're coming out all the time. What yeah. are you looking forward to, Pete? Oh, man. Battle Chasers number 10 and Click Click Boom number 1. Mm. Ooh, nice. Justin, what about you? Great question. There are two books that I am looking forward to, and I want to say them right now. Sorry, my mic just broke for a brief moment, and I fixed it. Uh, I'm looking forward to... Yeah, that's uh, what we're asking. What are you looking forward to? That's what you're asking me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These yeah. questions really come fast. And yeah, I'll tell you are... what I don't want you to say. Does that help? Does that help? A ramp? Uh, I could, you know, no, not helpful. I oh, got to I, I Wait, can I guess what Pete doesn't want you to say? Yeah. Is it Wolverine? Yeah. Yeah, is it, it is. Is it Amazing I... Spider-Man? You're right. You're oh, right. Well, all right. I'm not going to pick those. Uh, maybe we'll discuss both those books, which I have uh, nuanced in- takes on the both of them. Ooh, I got a shout out Nostalgia nuance. Number One from Comicsology, which oh, I that's really a enjoyed. Uh, mm-hmm. Great book, mm-hmm. and then Something Epic Number Two from oh, Image. Man, nice. also great, very nostalgic. Both both books uh, really just great writing across the board. Mm-hmm. Something epic also great about, art. Yeah, great art. It's just really interesting, uh, unique books. Definitely check both of those out. 
The two that I'm going to call out, I am loving the Clobber in Time book from Steve Yes, Scrooge, dude. Thing team up book. The Scrooge. It's so much fun. Such good art. Can't wait for the new issue. And the other one that I'm going to call out that I'm very curious about is Void Rivals number one. Yes, uh, dude. Ton, yes. Ton of press about this. Some secret stuff. You probably could found the spoilers online. I'm not going to say what they are here. Ooh, but I almost book. said them. I almost More than said anything, it. it's a new book from Robert Kirkman and Lorenzo De Felici which is great, great team there. So I would read anything that they do, but very curious to talk about that. And the rest of the books with you guys, all of them are going to be at our Stack podcast that posts Wednesday at 9 a.m. in the Comic Book Club feed and its own dedicated Stack feed. And folks, that is it for this week's show. Yeah! A all couple right. of people yeah. we want to thank. Hold on, hold on. We Woo. want to thank Tilly Walden for coming on. You can check out Clementine Book One in bookstores everywhere right now. And Clementine Book Two is coming out October yes. 4th from Skybound and Comic Shops and October 10th in bookstores. Alex Believe, the Marvel art of Alex Believe going up on Kickstarter very soon, as well as oh, it looks Brian amazing. Bendis coming in September next week. We're going to have another great show for you guys. Jeffrey Brown is going to be back on the show to talk about his new adorable book, Thor and Loki Midgard Family yes. Mayhem. James Aquiline is going to be here. And Van Jensen is going to be here to talk about Zoop's Stardust Anthology. Also, check out Sons of a Gun, our DC podcast. We've been counting down to The Flash, and we're going to talk about that highly anticipated movie. We are all equally hyped for it, and we're going to be talking about it later on. Um, Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast. We've been doing a couple of news podcasts leading into Secret Invasion. Riverdale yeah. After Dark, our Riverdale podcast running every week. We're going to try to do a mailbag episode this Ooh, week. Mailbag up. Patreon.com slash comic book club to support the show and all the shows we do. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow. At Comic Book Live on Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram or TikTok, ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, good night. Good Take night, care folks. of yourself. Later. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.